Hi, thank you so much for coming. Um, we're the practicum team from this spring. Um, our title of our presentation is called No Rain, No Gain. Um, it's a analysis of the benefits and opportunities of urban, urban rainwater harvesting in San Francisco. Our client was the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission, which is the like water masterminds of the whole Bay Area. Oh, oh. She, she didn't yeah, get here. Oh. Okay. No worries. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, our names are Charlie, Michael, Bridget, Luke, and my name's Maddie. Um, these guys are seniors. I'm a junior. Um, and we are so grateful for having this opportunity. We think we've grown and learned a lot. Um, and we also really want to take this time to thank Nusha. Um, for advising us and supporting us and pushing us when you know we were exhausted. <laughs> <laughs> so our agenda for today, we're going to um, go over a little bit of background of water system stuff that you probably need to know in order to understand some of our analysis. Uh, we're going to talk about our charge and what the SFBUC asked us to investigate. Um, our data set, which was um, a mon monster in and of itself. Um, and then defining efficiency and how we scored these projects and what metrics we came up with. Um, the creation of efficiency metrics, evaluating projects based off of those efficiency metrics, and then creating recommendations and then our actual recommendations. So as a little bit of background, this is a picture of San Francisco's water system, very dumbed down. Um, so San Francisco gets about 85% of its water from the Hetch Hetchy River um, River reservoir, reservoir up in the in Yosemite, and the water is pumped and uses gravity to travel down about 200 miles of pipes, and then get pumped back up into San Francisco. In San Francisco, there are about 850,000 um, residential uh, customers of this water. Um, overall, in the Bay Area, this water goes to 2.6 million customers, um, and this provides. It's some of the cleanest water in the country, but it also provides some challenges. So some of these challenges um, are, one. the big one is a combined sewer system. So San Francisco and many of the old cities have one combined sewer system, which means that both sewage and stormwater, um, so rainfall and things like that, go into the same sewer, which creates difficulties when there's storms and the sewer backs up. Because not only are you backing up into the street, like just like rainwater, you might also be getting sewage, which is obviously disgusting. Um, in San Francisco, when this happens, they estimate that about 95% of it is um, stormwater, but 5% of it um, ends up being sewage. And in order to deal with this, San Francisco kind of um, opens up some of the sewer and dumps part of it into the uh, bay. And then the regional water board, which New South fits on, slaps them with a big fine. Um, so we need to uh, minimize the overflows in the sewer system in order to, obviously, like the overflows are problematic themselves and so is the fine. Um, additionally, um, Yosemite is pretty far. They're traveling over 200 miles in pipes. Um, so water is expensive here and every time we use tap water, we don't really think about it. And so the more we can reuse water, the better for everybody. Um, and then there's a very specific dry season and a very specific rainy season. So in the summer, we use a ton of water. And in the winter, um, we use less and less water, especially in terms of irrigation. And so the um, water demand and, um, is very like uh, topsy-turvy throughout the year. And then additionally, we have changing weather conditions, which are going to make this dry season more dry and more droughts. Mm -hmm. And the rainy season have more um, big storms. So overall San Francisco water use trends, um, from 2005 to 2015, this green line shows overall San Francisco water use, which you can see is trending downwards. This is led by per capita water use becoming more and more efficient, even as you can see population is, is slowly increasing. But over the next 40 years, so this shows 2005 to 2015 and then projections to 2040, um, the population is expected to increase by about 300,000 people, um, a little bit faster than it has been, as you can see. And while per capita water use is continued to trend downwards um, because of the population increase, San Francisco's overall water use 
is going to go downwards but then level out. Okay, so next, um, an important concept that um, we're going to use throughout the presentation <coughs> is important for understanding um, a lot of the water systems in San Francisco is the distinction between potable and non-potable water. So potable water is the water um, that we usually think of as you know being used in buildings and coming from the tap. So it's clean water that is safe for drinking and other purposes like bathing. Um, however, there are a lot of uses of water in a building that don't need to be potable. Um, so for example, irrigating the lawns and green spaces, um, flushing toilets and using them for internal mechanical purposes like cooling. Um, those sources don't need to be potable. Um, and so when buildings are able to use non-potable sources of water, um, in order to meet those uses, we say that they're offsetting potable water. So um, looking at what those kinds of systems look like that could use non-potable water and reuse it, um, we can see this is an example of a building um, and all of the different sources that could go into making up their water. So we can see that black water in the top left is wastewater from toilets and dishwashers and kitchen sinks. Um, that needs to be filtered and cleaned pretty thoroughly in order to be reused again for a, any purpose. Then there's gray water, which is a little bit less dirty, um, which comes from um, bathtubs, washing machines, and things like that, um, that can be cleaned um, a bit more easily. And then we have storm water that is collected at the ground, um, and that often has you know, some, some contamination based on you know, running through the streets and running on the ground. Um, and then that often flows and seeps down into the ground and can sometimes become foundation drainage um, and be collected from the foundation of the building. And then lastly, we have rainwater, which um, tends to be a lot cleaner than these other sources because it's collected right at the top of the building before it gets contaminated um, very much. And so rainwater is something that we're going to be focusing on throughout this presentation but also thinking about how these other sources fit into the overall water context for a building. So looking at how those sources kind of come together within a building, we can see that storm water, gray water, black water, and foundation drainage sort of come in similarly um, and are treated and then eventually flow into the rest of the system. Whereas rainwater is collected right at the source and so flows in separately into a large uh, tank which is called a cistern, um, and then is filtered and um, you know, treated a little bit before being used for these non-potable sources, um, such as toilet flushing and irrigation, um, but not for drinking purposes. And so um, the cistern and the rainwater part of the system are going to be important to understand, as well as the fact that all of these systems within the building kind of have a limit to how much they can intake, and so when there's too much water, um, they overflow into the sewer. So um, the water sector in general, and San Francisco especially, um, has been trying to move towards a one water approach. So in the past, we thought of water systems as having potable water come in for all uses, and then you know coming out of the tap and being used and going directly into the sewer, um, no matter, you know, what it was used for or whether it could be reused. But in the future and starting um, you know, in the past few years, San Francisco um, has been really pushing this one water approach, which means thinking holistically about the water within a building and where it can come from and what it can be used for and trying to make the use of water in a building as secular as possible. And so part of this means matching the right source for the right use. So non-potable sources of water to non-potable uses um, and thinking more holistically about the water cycle in a building. So in order to do this, the SFPUC has put in some regulations to promote the efficiency and uh, resiliency of their water resources, uh, two of which concerned our project. The first one is the non-potable ordinance, uh, and that one requires capture and uh, treating of available on-site water resources for reuse and reduce uh, the amount of potable water used to meet non-potable demand. Uh, this one started in 2012, and the program provided about $500,000 uh, in grant funding for projects that wanted to voluntarily uh, participate. 
It wasn't until 2016 that this uh, became a requirement for projects that were over 250,000 square feet. Uh, the next one is the stormwater management ordinance, and this one uh, wants to decrease runoff being sent to the sewers to improve and protect water quality. This one was uh, implemented in 2010, uh, and since then, about 193 acres of projects have been uh, uh, subject to this ordinance. So this is a uh, picture that we took off of the SFPUC website. Um, I don't intend for you to be able to read all this, but you can see that they have different requirements, they have different, um, uh, uh, they apply to different projects, so different developments have to uh, uh, comply with either one, and sometimes they overlap. Uh, and all the other thing is that for these two ordinances, the SFPUC has two different teams that work on these ordinances. So uh, sometimes they work together, but most of the time they don't. Um, so we have to keep this in mind as we move forward, move forward with our analysis. So the SFP asked us to answer a pretty specific question. They wanted to know how they're doing in terms of um, implementing the SMO, and then they want to know how they can better implement the, the SMO in a way that would also provide synergies with the NPO, both internally and uh, um, like internal structure of the SFPUC as well as within their projects. Um, and the most important thing is that the goal of the SMO is to create offsets and decrease the amount of tap water that's being used for irrigation, toilet flushing, and other things that it doesn't need to be used for. How are they doing in terms of that? And what, they, what can they be doing better? So we broke this question down into a few constituent questions that we thought that we could answer better. So one was, is there a difference in stormwater management efficiency between commercial, mixed use, res or residential rainwater systems? So this got to, is there a difference in efficiency based on building type? The next one, is there how much additional non-potable demand is being met through the inclusion of additional waters um, and other patterns based on building type or factors? So this gets to, um, is there a difference in efficiencies based on the source of non-potable water that projects are using? Um, and then, what, you know, obviously what building factors um, differentiate in terms of which sources they're using. So for this, for example, um, like a residential building has more um, kitchen sinks, for, so they have more kitchen sink water that might be able to be reused compared to a um, commercial building, where if it's just offices, there's probably less of that specific type of non-portable source. Um, then the overall question um, that ended up becoming really important was how do you define efficiency and what are the metrics that we could create to help them define efficiency? And then are there patterns to which types of projects are able to achieve rainwater efficiency? This is specifically with their rainwater systems on the roof. Um, and how policies and regulations can be revisited to enhance productivity and efficiency of these projects and the system as a whole. Um, so some of the things that we found most challenging was understanding all of the vested interests in our project and how they all interact. So these are just some of the interests that were in our introductory meeting with the SFPUC. We think that there were like eight to ten people in that meeting. Um, so the SFPUC water director um, oversees both the SMO and the the NPO, but I, in general, she has the most um, vested interest in seeing them work synergistically within the same um, building. But she also has to deal with the politics down at City Hall. Every time the SFPUC wants to increase their standards for developers, the cost of developing a project in San Francisco increases, and that provides a lot of backlash. Um, our project manager was uh, working really hard to manage two or three different teams and eight busy people to get them to show up to our meetings, comment on things, and really work together. And because we had both an SMO specialist and an NPO specialist, that was pretty difficult because both of them wanted to see us analyze the projects that we were given in terms of their ordinance and how they were doing and implementing their ordinance. And so that was always a tag team. And then we also had a consultant who sort of would pop in and provide guidance, but also didn't necessarily want to be super critical, and managing, um, uh, I guess, her interests too were, was um, another thing we thought about. So our initial observations um, with the way that the SMO in internal SFPUC process works 
is that there's a the um, SMO specialist meets directly with the owner of the build, building, the engineer, the architect, and the landscape architect in at the SFPUC headquarters. And in that meeting, the SM, the SMO specialist within the SFPUC holds all of the institutional knowledge about how these projects best work. Um, there's two additional rounds of application review where they can kind of go based on their gut and they can either approve or deny a building's plan and they can provide comments. Um, but in general, we thought that the developer meeting provides the best opportunity because the SMO specialist really can say, this is what makes a good project good, this is what you have to do to get your project to that, that place. Um, and then currently, they're going based on their gut feeling, so they, they're just like in their gut, they know what makes a good project, what, you know, if they, a project comes in, they can look at the specifications about it and be like, you should do this, like, they provide a lot of advice, but that, they're not necessarily strict standards that they're saying, you know, we know that if a building meets these standards, that makes them good, it's going, going off of gut feeling what these projects should be doing. Um, and so in exploring our data set, uh, we thought it was important for you to understand uh, not only what it consisted of, but how this data set was compiled, um, hint, very manually. Um, so we were given uh, 76 SMO compliant projects and NPO uh, that were established from 2011 to 2018. Um, in addition to these, we were given three forms um, from which we were able to pull information and input them into a blank uh, spreadsheet or data set that we were doing. <coughs> um, and so in looking at these different types of applications, um, I don't expect you to be able to read any of this, but it's important just to know what information that it gives us. Um, so this is the NPL application. It's introduced at the beginning of the develop development process um, by the developer, and it outlines uh, generic attributes like gross square footage, um, uh, the type of building, uh, what kind of sources and end uses the building will use uh, to offset non-potable water, um, or to offset potable water. Um, this is the rain, uh, rainwater harvesting calculator. This is the SFPUC's black box where they can um, input some of these attributes given to them by the developer into these green cells, and out in the white cells pops uh, forecasts or um, estimations of different demands that the building will require to meet its uh, uh, potable offsets. Um, and finally, this is the stormwater management plan. So for us, having no experience in any of this, um, figuring out what data was relevant and what data was correct was a very strenuous process um, because many buildings have uh, different um, different uh, attributes will apply to the roof or the rainwater harvesting contributing area and certain planters will either be draining to the cistern or not draining to the cistern and so this was a process of, of trial and error and of heavy communication with the SFBUC and making sure our data set was accurate and, uh, and could uh, inform our analysis better down the line. Um, and so, all in all, we had a uh, we had 76 projects, um, a bunch of different attributes, um, all taken from these at various applications, and uh, all compiled in one uh, large uh, data set. Um, and so, some of these variables, uh, these we call the attributes or building attributes, things like gross square footage, um, rainwater harvesting contributing area square foot. Uh, the different rainwater harvesting use types and their BMP types, which is what they use to capture, uh, capture this water. Um, we had the different types of non-potable supplies, so this is black water, gray water, et cetera, and their runoff. Um, next, we looked at demands. Um, so their runoff uh, available, runoff captured, um, daily reuse demand, irrigation demand, et cetera. Um, and finally, some different calculations using these last uh, metrics for demand. Um, you know, percent that, uh, uh, and so on. And so now to take a look at some of the basic trends uh, that we identified before we got into the heart of our analysis, um, we wanted to, or we used ArcGIS to create a geospatial density map that just gives you a better idea of where these projects are located throughout the city. Um, as you can see, they are they are predominantly in the northeast uh, corner, which is uh, where there is both. Uh, population density or high population density and a lot of the new development is happening um, and a lot of gross square footage is, is growing throughout the city. Um, next, uh, this is 
all 76 projects, as you can see, uh, around 50% of 36 of the buildings were mixed use. Um, 17 or 22% were multifamily residential, 20 in commercial, and only three residential. So keep that in mind, the sample size is small for residential um, throughout the rest of the project. Um, this is, out of all these 76 projects, in total they offset roughly 84 million gallons of uh, potable water using non-rainwater and rainwater sources. Um, mixed use disproportionately represents a larger amount of this, uh, of, uh, this, of, this, of these projects. Um, multifamily residential, although representing 22% of the projects, only brings in 17% of the total offsets. Commercial is roughly equivalent to its uh, portion of the projects, and residential is very little um, to uh, further the cost. Um, now looking at uh, the average annual non-potable demand from each building type specifically, and then also how these building types predominantly uh, are meeting their demand. Uh, so as you can see, commercial buildings are the least likely to meet their demand, but on average capture and reuse the most non-potable water in their buildings. Um, further, multifamily residential projects on average reuse more rainwater than mixed-use developments. However, mixed-use developments reuse significantly more rainwater sources compared to multifamily residential projects. Um, next, we want to look at just rainwater harvesting and the offsets provided uh, by those. Uh, as you can see, commercial, like you saw in the last uh, slide, represents almost 50% of the total rainwater harvesting offsets, um, followed by mixed-use and multifamily residential. And again, rainwater is um, a very small portion of this 11.2 million gallons of rainwater offsets. Um, next, we wanted to just understand uh, does size matter in this, and are the larger buildings representing a larger amount of the uh, rainwater offsets? And we found that it does, the first quartile, broken down by just gross square footage of the building, um, represents almost uh, 5 million of these gallons, um, and it decreases as the size of the building decreases. So one of the main things that we had to focus on is how do we define efficiency and how do we score projects based on efficiency. Um, so to be efficient, this is uh, like a general qualitative description of what makes something efficient. These are all things that we had to think about. So a project needs to capture a certain percentage of its runoff because again the goal of the SMO is to keep runoff from ending up in the sewers during rainstorms. And so we wanted to do that job. But we also want it to a project to use a reasonable portion of that water to offset its potable demand inside the building. Okay. Then we want the the project to size its roof area and its cistern volume to maximize capture and reuse. And we want the project to be able to appropriately vary um, and balance with the droughts and then high rainstorms in the wet season and drought season. So our baseline metrics from the original data set that were provided uh, were the percentage of available runoff captured and reused and the amount of potable water offset by rainwater harvesting. These are things that we could calculate that might score um, different buildings um, on how they're doing. But these metrics are misleading in isolation. So here's an example. So we have Project A capture 75% of their available runoff, that's all the water that hits the roof, and they harvest 50,000 gallons of rainwater per year. Perfect. Project B captures only 50% of their roof, and they harvest only 100,000 gallons of rainwater a year. But Project A has a demand for a million gallons of non-potable water per year, and does not use other sources in order to meet that demand. Project B only has a demand of 200,000 gallons of non-potable water per year, and they use an additional 100,000 gallons of gray water to meet that demand. So Project B is meeting 100% of their non-potable demand, even though they're not necessarily capturing all of the rain that hits their roof, whereas Project A is capturing more of the rain, but is meeting less of their demand, 
And so in general, this is just a uh, thought experiment around the fact that one efficiency metric or even two efficiency metrics doesn't give you the whole picture. And it needs to be a, co um, a combination of several in order to see all the different attributes um, that lead towards efficiency. Great, so we put together a couple of main metrics that we wanted to base our analysis off of that we thought were the best at capturing that big picture holistic view of efficiency and that when looked at in combination would do a good job of telling us which buildings could stand to improve. So the first one we looked at was that percent of runoff captured and reused. So this is looking at the amount of the roof that is draining to the cistern generates a certain amount of runoff every year just in the rain that hits it and that can be captured. When the cistern fills up in the rainy season, the, uh, run, the additional runoff then overflows to the sewer, and that's what's not captured. So when we look at the percent of runoff captured and reused, we're really just looking at the frequency of how often the cistern is overflowing. And what we find is that, for the most part, buildings are doing a pretty good job of capturing most of the runoff they generate. So the bulk of the projects are located in uh, this uh, box here, meaning that they're capturing 90 to 100 percent of that runoff. It indicates to us that their cisterns are properly sized compared to their contributing area to do a good job of capturing all of that. But then outside of that range, we see pretty, sig pretty even distribution uh, across the board with a fairly even amount of projects capturing anywhere from 80% uh, of their runoff to just 11 to 20% of their available runoff. So what we want to do is we want to figure out why these buildings are ending up in this area and what led them to size their systems so that they overflow so frequently. A second uh, variable we wanted to look at was the ratio of uncaptured runoff to completely unmet demand. So what we're looking at here is, we mentioned before that it's really important to look at other sources of non-potable demand or supply when we look at demand. So what we do is we take the building's complete demand um, it, uh, it's total demand for non-potable water, and then we subtract out all of the non-potable resources that go into it. So that's gray water and black water, foundation drainage, and rainwater. So what we're looking at at the end of the day for this completely unmet demand is basically the amount of potable water that's being used for a non-potable demand, which in our case, we want to minimize that amount. For the uncaptured runoff, we're looking at basically how much water overflows when the cistern fills up and the building can't reuse that water. And what this variable is trying to get at is the ratio between those two. We want to find buildings that are either meeting all of their demand or are capturing all of their runoff. But if a building is not capturing all of its runoff and not meeting all of its demand and has ample resources in both, we want to understand why that building has sized its system so that it can't meet that goal. And so I'm going to walk you through how we calculated this so it makes some more sense. Uh, the first project, each one of these three is a hypothetical project. One that is high efficiency, one that's medium efficiency, and one that's low efficiency. And we're going to hold their demand for rainwater and their runoff captured constant. So uh, quickly, the rainwater demand is the total demand for non-potable water minus the demand met by gray water and black water and such. So this is specifically the demand that's left over after using those primary resources that can be met with rainwater. So holding these constant and changing the amount of runoff that's available, we can get a sense of how much a building uh, or how much a project could stand to improve by properly sizing its rainwater harvesting system. So for this high efficiency project, the amount of uncaptured runoff it has is just a very small portion of its unmet demand. You know, cap sizing its cistern to capture all of that runoff would only meet 8% of the remaining demand. So we might be a little softer on that development for not sizing up all the way. However, for the inefficient project, we find that the uncaptured runoff is 75% of the unmet demand. And we want to wonder why a building that could stand to save, to spend, or to not have to buy 75% of its demand in potable water for a non-potable use, we choose to have a rainwater harvesting system that's too small to capture the available resources. So that's our second variable. And what we find is that, for the most part, buildings are doing pretty well. So this zero bucket here are buildings that have either no uncaptured runoff or no unmet demand. 
So they're perfect for us. They're either meeting all of their demand for rainwater harvesting and a combination of the other non-potable sources, or they are capturing 100% of the rain that hits their roof. In either case, we don't have much to say about them. Uh, for the rest of them, we find that uh, here, these are also pretty high efficiency. Uh, so this ratio is very low, meaning that, again, the, uh, they don't stand to gain too much from sizing their cisterna up. Um, but then we also find quite a few buildings that have very high ratios, especially in looking at this over three. There are a lot of buildings that have over three times as much uncaptured runoff as unmet demand, and those are the ones we really want to investigate thoroughly to figure out why they've chosen to size their operations so small. And lastly, our third variable is the percent of rainwater demand met by rainwater harvesting. So we're looking at the leftover non-potable demand after other sources are used, and we're looking at how much of it is actually being met by rainwater. So this is a good indicator of how well they're doing in sizing their systems to meet their demands. And it's also looking at how far they are from being able to meet 100%. So again, we have three buildings that are similar in some ways, and especially in that they all have the same ratio we just looked at. So their uncaptured runoff is 50% of their unmet demand. But you can see that these buildings are different, and we wouldn't want to hold them to the same standard, because this within reach project over here would only have to size its rainwater harvesting operation up by a small bit to meet the rest of that, uh, to capture the rest of that rainwater, um, and to meet 50% more of its demand or 50% of its remaining demand. This long shot pro project, on the other hand, would have to size up its uh, operation quite a bit. So by looking at this percent of the runoff captured to the rainwater demand, we get a reasonable proxy of how close they are to being able to hit their full demand. For this long shot project, we wouldn't expect it to uh, quintuple its rainwater harvesting program to meet all of its demand because we believe that it put, it sized its uh, program around here uh, for good reasons, probably cost, probably that space in the cistern that could be used as you know, usable living space, for example. So here, this metric, we want to focus on these buildings that are within reach. And then looking at a histogram of this, we find a very interesting pattern. Uh, we find that a lot of buildings are doing well. So these are the buildings that have uh, that are meeting all of their non-potable demand through rainwater, or have no demand left for rainwater. They're meeting all of their demand through other non-potable sources. We have a big bulk of them around here that are meeting 10, 20, 30 percent of their demand with rainwater. But uh, here, in this area, we have this huge dip of buildings that are just not really falling in this range of meeting 50 to 80 to 90 percent of their demand through rainwater. And a tentative hypothesis we have for this is that buildings are choosing to either maximize how much they're, what percent they're capturing, so they're minimizing their rainwater harvesting contributing area by capturing 100 percent of it, or they're trying to meet all of their demand, so they're moving all the way to this 9100 range. And we'll look more into that later. Um, so we also wanted to 